Well, you know, last week we did part one of the history of the church uh, from Pentecost, that we thought was the birthday of the church, the event of Pentecost, until um, the uh, until around the year uh, 1000. And we're going to pick up where we left off with the east-west schism of the, uh, uh, of the church. This is the, the, this is the first schism that, or division that took place in the church, and it happened in, in 1054. And we're going to go from there at least until Vatican II, which took place in the 1960s and through to our uh, current time. So we're kind of picking up where we left off. Uh, a schism is something that is important to know about. And the reason it's so important to know about is um, the, ch- the, the Christian faith is splintered. Do you know how many divisions there are in the in the uh, in the Christian faith. Uh, well, there's three main divisions, right? Catholicism, Protestantism, and Orthodoxy. But within Protestantism in particular, there are over 35,000 denominations. Uh, the church is absolutely split. Uh, I know that we can't name all those denominations. I can't. I can maybe name 10 of them, the larger ones, the ones that are more historic. And a lot of people who start churches today, the number would be greater than 35,000, actually call themselves non-denominational. Like Grace Church in um, Snellville is non-denominational in that uh, they don't belong to the Southern Baptist Convention. They don't follow... uh, Wesleyanism or Calvinism. They're not Presbyterians. They're not, uh, they're not Methodists. And so they, um, they want to kind of roll their own religion, so to speak. Uh, and so they, uh, they say, well, we're just Bible-believing Christians. I'm just teaching cr- Jesus crucified. Uh, let's keep it simple. I don't want... Uh, a lot of rules and regulations and, 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 and dogma and teachings. I'm just teaching from the Bible. Uh, that's what they'll, they will tell you in non-denominational churches. And as, I'm not saying that that, that is, is wrong or anything like that. I'm just saying it, it splinters Christianity even more. And you should know that Jesus did not want a divided church. In fact, he, he foresaw that the church would be divided and he prayed that this wouldn't happen. Uh, in fact, we, we have that prayer recorded in John's Gospel, in the 17th chapter of John's Gospel, as a matter of fact. Jesus prays what's called by theologians a high priestly prayer, uh, and he, he prays, in particular, for the church. He's praying that the church be one. I pray not only for them, meaning the apostles, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's us. So that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, and that the world may believe that you sent me. See, that, that was Jesus' prayer, that they may all be one. Where I was reading from uh, John 17, 20 and 21. Anyway, um, but the, that's not what we have. We have a divided church. And the three main divisions are uh, Catholicism, Orthodoxy, which split from Catholicism, over a dispute about the authority of the Pope in 1054. We talked about that last time. And Protestantism, which we will be talking about tonight. Those are the three main divisions. But under Protestantism is where you have 
even a greater division. Okay, so now we are getting uh, further along, uh, maybe around the year 1084 and beyond. And between these dates of 1084 and 1256, bless you, uh, there were several important things that happened. And one of the very important things was the founding of some of these religious orders. These are orders that you might have heard about. The Carmelites, the Franciscans, the Dominicans, the Benedictines. Um, and these were important because the church needed to increase its missionary activity. And the founders of these churches knew that. And so they were missionaries. They also founded hospitals and universities. In fact, some of the first universities were founded by Catholic orders. Uh, so these orders did a lot for the church. Okay. Uh, the Carmelites, uh, they come from the 13th century. And they, uh, it, it, Carmelite comes from Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Uh, and uh, we have Carmelites, and Franciscans, Dominicans, and Benedictines even here in the uh, Archdiocese of Atlanta. Number six, you know, we had ten peak moments of church history. Uh, five was that great split in 1054. But six is uh, the, um, the founding of the Franciscan order. And a particular person, St. Francis, and our current pope, Pope Francis, took his name from uh, St. Francis. St. Francis was a very big uh, part of the church um, in the Middle Ages because he was different than some of the, of the other religious orders who were, um, they spent their lives living in community, supporting one another, and in prayer. Uh, rather than, that would be the contemplative life, rather than the active life in religious order, which is to go out and be missionaries, be teachers, be, uh, be doctors and nurses, and things like that. Okay, So this order was different in that it focused on the active life rather than the contemplative life. And many orders, of course, do both. That's the goal of most orders today. Uh, the order that Father Sonny belongs to is a missionary order. And uh, so St. Francis started this order in particular ministering to the poor and the destitute. Those who in middle, medieval times were clustered around the city walls, you know, uh, because the only place that they could get help is in the cities and, uh, and the monasteries at the time. You can go to Assisi, France, uh, I'm sorry, Assisi, Italy, uh, and you can actually see that city is still there. There's a modern city around it, and you'll see that the city was even expanded in the 1100s and the 1300s. It was expanded. It's got two sets of walls because of that. And you can, you can actually see uh, the place where St. Francis is buried. You've been there, huh? Uh, we had the opportunity to take a tour of, uh, of Italy a, a few years ago with the Archdiocese of Atlanta. And um, it was a, a, a group of uh, students who were uh, uh, in training to become permanent deacons like me. And at that time, I was an instructor in the permanent diaconate program for the Archdiocese. So myself and uh, one priest uh, and another deacon who was the director of formation uh, and a bunch of these students and their wives uh, went on this trip. And one of the most beautiful places that we thought of the entire trip was Assisi. Just the countryside around there and everything. It's unbelievable, right? Uh, 
And the high point of the whole thing was that uh, we got to celebrate Mass in the crypt where St. Francis is actually, where his casket is. And it's not buried in the ground. It's actually suspended above the altar. Okay. So, and the altar is the old-fashioned altar that faced away from the congregation. And so here's, here's, the, um, here's the altar, and up here is the casket. Okay, so uh, drawing that mass, uh, uh, at the time of the elevation of the elements, where the priest raises the host, and the deacon raises the chalice, uh, I was able to touch the chalice to the casket of St. Francis and I got goosebumps everywhere, you know, and Jan's in the back crying, you know, uh, she cries at anything. Uh, and uh, so th that, was, that was something that we'll, uh, they'll never forget. But these Franciscan friars took up his way of living and they had a great zeal for the conversion of the Muslims at the time, which were trying to really infiltrate into Europe. Um, and this whole thing of converting them as they occupied different areas of Europe became uh, encouraged even a lot more missionary activity. And the friars, as they were called, traveled from one place to another, uh, and they carried on the missionary zeal of their founders, like St. Uh, Francis. So that was good. We can't talk about the Middle Ages unless we talk about the Inquisition just a little bit. I don't want to spend much time on that. Any one of these subjects could, could, one could have a whole course in. Uh, and the church really gets a bad rap for the Inquisition, uh, and there, are, there have been movies made. There have even been comedies made about it. Uh, and there are some books that have been published lately. Uh, and you can find them especially on www.catholic.com. That's Catholic Answers website. Uh, that will give you the true historical uh, uh, basis for the Inquisition uh, and takes some of the blame out of it when you get down to true history. You know, a lot of times we have, we read history and we have preconceived notions. Uh, we do that when we read the Bible. We have preconceived notions about events and characters and when we read it, we read those preconceptions into it, you know. Um, my, uh, I'm taking a, an old history course from a scripture scholar right now, and she is telling us to do close readings about certain characters. Um, I did a close reading about Hagar. Uh, that was Sarah of Sarah and Abraham's uh, maidservant. She was the mother of Ishmael, might remember. Okay, well... You know, we have, a lot of people who study the Old Testament have a preconceived notion that she was immoral because of what happened to her. Okay. Uh, and that's the preconception of almost everybody who studies history. But when you do a close reading and you understand the culture of the times, you realize she wasn't. Actually, you know, she was just trying to do the best she can. She was disadvantaged as... Uh, a, uh, uh, as, a, as a servant girl uh, and she had to do what her mistress commanded uh, and that was Sarah uh, and once she ended up pregnant with Abraham's son Ishmael um, and Sarah is very very nasty to her uh, maybe she's jealous I don't know uh, but, you know, she runs away and God says, hey, go back there. I'm going to take care of you in Ishmael. And she believes and she does. She never, she never whines. She never cries. You know, she does the best that she can, even from her disadvantaged uh, point. And she, was, she, she had her part to play in the transmission of the promise of the covenant at that time. You know, so uh, all I 
I got off the topic, but I, I just wanted to emphasize this. Sometimes we have preconceived notions. But as far as the Inquisition goes, you'd really have to know that there are, were really four Inquisitions, these four. Come on in. We know there was a traffic jam and all, and we're glad you're here. Uh, these were the four Inquisitions, okay? They were uh, mainly uh, established through, not the church, the state. The state, different countries, and the governments of different countries were very much connected with the church, and they were maybe too connected with the church. Uh, nowadays, we don't even realize that that's possible because we have a separation of church and state in most places, not in the Middle East, but in most places, and, um, and, and so it wouldn't happen today. But there were these four inquisitions, one's just called the medieval inquisition, the other Spanish, Portuguese, and, uh, and Roman. And they were meant to fight heresies. In other words, uh, teachings inconsistent with what the church has taught and believed from the beginning that would be um, promoted by certain individuals. And so when this type of thing was noticed, they would be... Um, you know, there would be a fine and there would be a, uh, a court hearing and all of this type of things. And it was really a civil situation. Uh, the church did get involved at one point. I'll change this slide and show you. There was a papal inquisition, okay, because it was a time in history where heresy uh, uh, became pretty widespread, again, as it was in the 4th century, 3rd and 4th centuries. Um, and this was established by Gregory the Ninth, and it was in uh, 1233. And this was actually given to the Dominicans rather than the, the uh, uh, what you would call the, the secular or diocesan priests, because the Dominicans were better educated than the typical uh, secular or diocesan priest was at the time. Not now, but at the time. Uh, and so when her heretics were brought to a court uh, who heard the case and judicated the case uh, were the Dominican uh, brothers. Okay? So this lasted for a period of time. Sometimes it got out of hand. Were there civil courts that, uh, that carried this beyond what they were supposed to do? Carried it beyond persuading the person differently and converting them to the truth? Uh, was there torture and sen death sentences involved in it? Yes, but they were not uh, uh, established by the church. They were... Uh, they were there were civil cases and, and the, civil, uh, uh, the, the civil courts got out of hand with this in several of these uh, periods of inquisition. The, um, as I say, we don't have time to go into it, and that's just a very short um, uh, synopsis of it. If you want to look into that, and especially if you want to get this particular book on the inquisition, uh, catholic.com. Uh, is the place to go. It, just, it was just published uh, this year. Uh, I don't know the exact title of it. Another thing I wanted to tell you about is the um, Great Western Schism. Now, this isn't an East-West Schism. It's a Western Schism. Uh, at one time, there were actually two popes. Somebody asked that a few weeks ago. At one time, was there two popes? And there was. And I'll give you a brief story about how this happened. Uh, it was in 1378, and it was time for the cardinals to come together in a con conclave, as they did a couple of years ago when Pope Benedict resigned and elect a new pope. And so they came from all of the countries, and they got together in Rome, and um, they were debating and discussing the issue, as the conclave does. That's the meeting of cardinals that to come together to elect a pope. 
and outside of the doors of the Vatican uh, where they were uh, where they were assembled they heard the crowd screaming we want an Italian we want an Italian Pope and so they made so much of, of a clamor that the Cardinal said well I guess we have our orders and they elected an Italian Pope and it ended up that this Italian Pope was quite a scoundrel not what they expected. And so the French bishops went back to France. And they got together and they said, you know, this election wasn't fair because we were influenced by the crowds assembled outside when we elected that pope. And so we sh should maybe elect another pope. And they did. And that pope took his place in Avignon, France. And so you had the pope and the anti-pope. And this was not a good time in church history because it was very confusing for people. Well, which pope do we actually listen to? Who's the pope? That's the first time in history that this had happened, right? Well, luckily, it didn't last for long because by 1417, the Pope, it was, it was decided what would happen. And uh, it ends up that the scoundrel passed away. Another Pope was elected in, I don't know, remember the exact names. Another Pope was e uh, elected in Rome and the papacy moved back to Rome. Rome was in pretty bad condition at the time. The Pope had stayed at the um, uh, ha had stayed at the Lateran Basilica, uh, but actually moved to a different place because that was all run down by the time. You know, yeah. May I ask you, why do you have that it was two anti-popes? Oh well, there were one is known in history what I mentioned, but there was even another one. Okay that is lesser known, and I don't know a lot about that. That's why I, uh, I, I don't mention it. I'd have to go back to the history books. But there, there actually were two, yeah. Uh, so that was a bad time in the history. Okay, so around the same time, now we're still in the 1300s, anybody who studied European history knows that there was a very, very, one of the darkest times in history was the time of the Black Plague in the 1340s. In fact, drawing that, uh, much of the population of Europe died. In fact, 2 million people died. 200 million. Yeah, sorry, 200 million. Yeah. Uh, and drawing this time, the church was the only institution that was trying to do something about that. The church was reaching out through hospitals to those who were dying and giving them the sacraments and, and caring for them when no one else would. Okay. Uh, in fact, it ended up killing off half of the population of Europe and two-thirds of all the clergy and religious were killed. Uh, you know, when you were diagnosed back then with the Black Plague, you, you lasted about two days before you died. Yeah. Which was a blessing. Yeah. yeah. Um, it is thought that today, that is MRSA. My brother had MRSA. Uh, and it just came on him all of a sudden. The next thing you know, he's in the hospital. Um, you know, and um, only if you caught this soon enough were you able to survive, you know. So, anyway, uh, that's something that's an important part of church history to know. Okay, so now we get to, remember I told you when I said we're going we're gonna to go through church history, that I would tell you the good, the bad, and the ugly. Okay, well, here's where it gets to... Uh, some parts that aren't so good. And 
it had mainly to do with the connection between church and state. Growing wealth and political importance caused ecclesiastical positions as positions in the church. Position like an abbot who's in charge of a monastery or a bishop uh, to be regarded as highly desirable sources of prestige and power. Oh boy. And gradually the spiritual character of those offices of the priests and abbots became obscured. While you should be a, a priest or a bishop or an abbot in charge of a monastery or a group of monasteries, you should be that if you deserve to be that by the type of life you live, by the type of virtues that you have and the type of skills that you have. Not simply because you are who you are or you're appointed by your brother to do that job, right? In fact, emperors of countries distributed appointments. Um, in other words, the Pope might say, I have someone in mind to be the Archbishop of Paris. And the king might say, oh, I have someone else in mind for that job. And the Pope might say, oh, you do? And go, yeah, my son. And so that was a, uh, that was a problem at the time. This is an abuse of power. These abuses place the church in a position of dependence upon the temporal powers, the civil powers, and often there were scandalous results of that. Some of our popes even led unedifying lives, as well as bishops and abbots, and some of them were found to have disregard for their vows of chastity, poverty, obedience, <laughs> and some of them even sold spiritual favors. You no. Know? You want your son baptized? 500 bucks? Okay. And I'll tell you what led up to number seven in a minute. I have a list of them all on the next slide. Okay. But uh, number seven in our ten peak moments of church history has to be um, the Protestant Reformation. And it began in uh, Wittenberg, Germany in the year 1517 with Martin Luther. Martin Luther was an Augustinian monk. Uh, and with that Protestant Reformation, the Catholic Church was confronted with a schism of immense proportions, bigger than the great East-West schism. And its influence, of course, is felt even to today. Uh, before I go over what caused the Protestant Reformation, let me just uh, talk about the two main characters in it, which were Martin Luther and John Calvin. Uh, so they would be spearheading the revolt. Now, they call it a reformation. Now, re reformation means to reform something. Uh, so many, many uh, Catholic theologians like to call it something else. Uh, but spearheading this revolt, if you want to call it that, was actually a Catholic priest, an Augustinian monk, Martin Luther, uh, whose denial of many of the church doctrines provided the impetus for this kind of church rebellion in Germany. And there was after him another priest, John Calvin. Calvinism, they are, we would know them as Presbyterians. And he supported the teachings of Luther and headed his own reform in Switzerland. Uh, and his movement quickly spread to France and other countries. And um, by the mid-1600s, Protestantism is a major force in Europe. So this is, a, uh, this is one of the biggest problems that the church has ever had. Uh, and so what caused it? These are all of the reasons, right? Uh, they're not in any particular order, but the interference in church affairs by civil authorities, that was a big one. That was a very, very big one. Uh, you, that should be on the top. But there were other things too. One of them was the deterioration of scholasticism. In other words, the training, the seminary training of priests. That 
was on a decline and by that time was down in the bottom of the barrel. Um, of course, these things are all different today. Uh, but that was a major problem at the time, something that should have been addressed. Uh, the greed of many European princes. You know, if you want to control your country and control the people, control any given community at that time, what was the best means of control? Control the church, right? Where did you get the most prestige and influence? From the church. So you aligned yourself with the church. Uh, so the greed of many European princes who simply used the church for their own purposes. Uh, and it's not to say that the church hierarchy didn't have any greed. They did too. So you'd have to put that in there too. In other words, doing things for their own good instead of the common good for the good of others. Okay. Uh, that Avignon pa papacy that I talked about, the Pope and the anti-Pope and moving out of Rome to France and all of that, right, that didn't do any good. That caused confusion. Right? Uh, the papal schism means when it split two popes. Uh, um, you had some popes that were mainly political and cultural and not spiritual. Okay? <laughs> So that didn't help, okay? And we don't know those in our lifetimes. They were all very, very spiritual in our lifetimes. But in the Middle Ages, things were different. It was the age of the Renaissance. And so the Renaissance popes are the ones that um, uh, we're talking about. There were some. Um, it's a handful, but there were some that were actually immoral themselves in the way that they lived. They weren't setting the example that they should. And you'll see how things changed after this. Uh, the Inquisition didn't help. The church's involvement in that. That was a scandal. Lay investiture means that uh, a lay person, just like you said, who does not belong in an ecclesiastical position because of the lack of education um, and because of not the proper spiritual character for the job, would get the job, right? Lay investiture. And simony, selling spiritual things or, or even sacraments um, for a, a profit. Those type of things are what caused the Reformation. Okay. And if you're talking about the Reformation, you can't do it without talking about Martin Luther. And so this particular paragraph I took from the textbook because um, it's, it's important to know this person. You see, Martin Luther was plagued by emotional anxieties. Okay. He... He was an Augustinian monk, and he entered a monastery at the young age of 22. And after an incident, he, he entered that monastery after an incident where he was caught in a severe thunderstorm. You ever caught outside in a severe thunderstorm? Uh, I was. One day, uh, my brother and my, uh, and my wife... No, no, Jan wasn't there. My brother and my sister-in-law and uh, my daughter-in-law and I uh, actually went to Louisiana and we were actually took a tube ride down a river. And during that tube ride, which was just lovely, uh, a big thunderstorm comes up and it starts raining. I mean, and it was pouring and pouring and pouring buckets. And the lightning was smashing right over our heads. And so, naturally, we got out of the water. That was a smart thing to do. And we took cover, you know. But we prayed because we thought we were going to die. Not just my daughter-in-law and I. I didn't know where my brother and his, and his wife were. Uh, but uh, 
but all of us there. And my daughter-in-law said to the other people, uh, my father-in-law is a minister, you know. And they said, well, will you pray for us? And so we all prayed because we thought we were in danger. Uh, Well, anyway, Martin Luther was caught in this type of storm, exceptionally severe thunderstorm. And in intense fear, in intense fear, he prayed to St. Anne and promised to join the monastery if he was saved from the storm. And so he was, and he joined the monastery. And in 1506, he made his profession as an Augustinian monk. Profession means you're making your vows. Okay? Um, and at this time in his life, he suffered from overwhelming sense of guilt. In other words, I could never be good enough to be saved, to go to heaven. Could never be good enough. Right? He, he, he thought very much of his unworthiness before God, which is the case with all of us. Um, and he thought that he could not be forgiven. Okay? And this plagued him day and night. Right? That's important to know. Because it's what led to his doctrine of sola sola fides. That is Latin for uh, faith alone. Sola fides. Faith alone. We are saved by faith alone, Martin Luther taught. Um, And he got this answer one day while he was studying two epistles of Paul, Romans and um, Galatians. And in Paul's letter to the Romans, he found a verse that seemed to change everything. All of a sudden, the weight of his guilt was lifted off of him. He was finally at peace. Uh, And it was a verse of Romans 1.17, which reads... The righteous shall live by faith, right? Not works, faith. Luther then developed that theology of justification by faith alone that's known as sola fides, right? And elsewhere, he found support for this in Galatians. Galatians 2.16. Know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ. Okay. So now he thought, well, all I have to do is believe and I'm saved. Then I don't have to worry about my guilt. I don't have to try to work to be saved. I'm saved by faith alone. That is the heresy of sola fides. We are saved by faith and works. What Paul was referring to in Romans and Galatians was the Judaizers. The Judaizers, if you'll remember, uh, on the very first day, in fact, we talked about it last week, the Judaizers were those Jews who were converted to Christianity in the very early church who believed that if a a non-Jew, a Gentile, wanted to become Christian and wanted to be saved, then they had to uh, be subject to the Jewish law first, right? Including circumcision for men. Uh, And uh, that's what prompted the first council of the church, the Council of Jerusalem in the year 49 AD, when Paul and Barnabas went uh, went to Jerusalem and got together everybody else, the apostles, and they all met and, and discussed the issue with the help of the Holy Spirit. And Peter got up and made his declaration that um, they shouldn't burden the Gentiles with the Jewish law. You know? Okay? Uh, so, because we're not saved by the works of the law, it meant the Jewish law. And there were a lot of things besides circumcision involved. So his principal beliefs were these. Uh, You know, uh, if yesterday, if you were at Mass, you heard uh, the Gospel from Matthew 25, 
when Jesus described the, how it will be on Judgment Day at the end of the world and how he, uh, the king will come with all his angels and separate. Uh, the whole world will be gathered in front of him and he'll separate the goats and the sheep, the goats on his left and the sheep on his right. And uh, he'll say to the people on his right, come and enter the kingdom of heaven because when I was hungry you fed me when I was naked you clothed me when I was sick and in jail you visited me and comforted me and they said oh no when, we didn't do that when did we do that for you oh when you did it for the least of my brothers you did it for me was the gospel from yesterday okay uh, the feast of Christ the king and uh, that is one one time when I was teaching in uh, I taught Catholic apologetics for the uh, diaconate formation program. And when we got to Sola Fide, uh, I gave them an instruction. It happened to be the last day before the summer break. So I said, this is your assignment over the summer. Uh, pick a gospel and find everything in that gospel that you can find. Read that gospel and find everything that would uh, indicate something else that, that would say it's not just faith alone, it's faith and works. And have that, write a paper on it and have that for me when, when we come back after the, the summer break. Uh, and of course, Matthew 25 was one of those things. And again, uh, when someone asked Jesus uh, what it took to enter the kingdom of heaven, uh, what did he say? Did he say, just have faith alone? No, he never said that. He said, obey the commandments. Right? Um, and he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. He would say things like that. In fact, he said, not all of those who cry out, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only him who obeys the precepts of my father. Right? So, it's faith and also responding to that faith by what we do. So, okay, so here's the principle of beliefs. One, the first belief was sola scriptura, that everything that's needed for uh, faith and morals, uh, one can find in the Bible, and that there's no other source of divine revelation of these things except the Bible. Well, this is the first time in history that that was taught, in 1517, because before that, nobody in Christianity taught that. Um, uh, it is scripture, sacred tradition, um, and a teaching authority of the church to interpret it and apply it to the uh, issues of the day. Uh, that together makes up divine revelation, not scripture alone. But for the first time, he taught scripture alone which is taught by much of Protestantism even today. Uh, he had a belief in baptism, so we did keep a couple of sacraments, including baptism. Uh, he believed much of what we believe about the Eucharist. That was his second sacrament, and only kept two. Uh, the others he threw out and said were not biblical. And when we get to the sacraments, I'll prove to you that every one of our seven sacraments was instituted by Christ, and we'll show you the exact New Testament scriptures uh, that, uh, that point to it explicitly. Uh, but anyway, uh, his belief was a little bit different than ours about what happens to the bread and wine at the uh, sacrament of the Eucharist. It's consubstantiation instead of what we call transubstantiation. And I'm going to skip over that for now because when we get to the Eucharist, we'll discuss those things. Okay, when we get to the sacraments, we're going to spend two, two um, sessions on the Eucharist in particular. Okay? So don't worry about that now. Uh, the other sacraments, other than baptism and the Eucharist, were not biblical, he taught. And the Mass is only a holy meal, not a sacrifice. The Church teaches that it is a sacrifice. It's the sacrifice of Christ on Calvary made present for us here in the 21st century, uh, as it was in the 16th century. Um, and that the communion of saints wasn't needed. In other words, to, uh, to revere uh, 
persons who had been canonized saints that we the church declared was in heaven uh, that it wasn't necessary to uh, revere them uh, or to ask for their intercession as as the church had always done from the very very earliest times the evidence of that is even in the catacombs underneath the streets of Rome from the first centuries uh, and that he believed in the priesthood of all believers, and we believe in the priesthood of all believers too. Uh, there is a particular priesthood, like Father Sonny and Father Abel are called to, but there also is the priesthood of all believers. Uh, when we are baptized, we are anointed with sacred chrism on the forehead, and we're anointed as Christ was anointed when he was baptized by John in the Jordan River, who was anointed by the Holy Spirit, anointed as priest, prophet, and king. And at our baptisms, every one of us is anointed priest, prophet, and king as well. Uh, so we join with Jesus in his ministry as priest, right? Uh, and as priest, he offers sacrifice. A priest's main job is to offer sacrifice. So... Um, Jesus offered the ultimate sacrifice of his life for us. Uh, and how we join him in that ministry is we offer the sacrifice of our lives. How we sacrifice for our family and others. Uh, we offer that sacrifice along with his to the Father. Our sacrifice alone wouldn't be good enough, but... Joined to his, it's efficacious. It has an effect for our salvation. Right? So the priesthood of all believers. We also join with Jesus in his, uh, uh, in his uh, mission uh, as a prophet by proclaiming the word of God by the way we live and as king. Uh, a good king doesn't lord over his people. Instead, a good king is, knows he's a public servant and serves others, does what he does for the common good, which we are called as Christians to do as well. The priesthood of all believers. Okay. So then John Calvin comes along, and like Luther, he is teaching script, uh, scripture alone. Uh, and, but unlike Luther, he rejects the real presence of Christ in the sacrament of the Eucharist. Uh, and he teaches something different. Now a new twist, predestination. That God knows who's going to heaven and who's not going to heaven before they're born even. And that he predestines them uh, for heaven or for hell. Now I'm not saying that God doesn't know because God knows all, right? Uh, but God doesn't will that anybody goes to hell. He doesn't predestine them to do that. Everyone has their own free will, and what he really wants is for everyone to go to heaven. They don't, but uh, God's desire is that he does. All right, so we talked about John Calvin and Martin Luther. What is another important figure of the Reformation? You'd have to say King Henry VIII. And instead of Lutherans or Presbyterians, you would know his followers of his church here in the United States today as Episcopalians, right? Uh, and in some places, they might be Anglicans, same thing. And in somewhere other than the United States, they would probably be called the Church of England, right? Uh, I noticed that in life... Uh, in um, Loganville, there's a cathedral, an Anglican cathedral. I didn't even know it. Passed it one day, and I thought, wow, that's cool. Uh, but he was once called by the Pope the defender of the faith. Uh, but here's what happened to him. Uh, the, the defender of the faith against Protestantism, against Calvinism and Lutheranism. <laughs> but something went wrong. He had a dilemma. His wife was not getting pregnant, okay? And so he wants a divorce. And so he petitions the Pope. After all, he's the King of England. He can do that. And it was Pope Clement VII at the time. 
Um, and he says, uh, 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 no annulment. He didn't want, there was a political problem with even granting that annulment uh, because the, uh, his wife, uh, first wife, was from uh, an influential uh, Spanish family. So anyway, it ended up that Henry said, oh yeah, you think I'm going to listen to you? I'm the king of England. And I'll be the head of the church in England. And all of the bishops had to agree to that, or it was, off with your head. They had to take a, an oath of loyalty to uh, Henry VIII. So, okay. Well, so here's what you had after a while. You had Lutherans, Episcopalians, or Anglicans, or the Church of England, you had Presbyterians um, and others. And if you were Lutheran, you would be, a today, you would be able to trace your church back to Martin Luther, the beginning of the Protestant Reformation in 1715. If you were an Episcopalian today, you would trace the beginnings of your church back to Henry VIII that we just talked about in 1534. If you were Presbyterian, you would uh, trace your church back to John Calvin and Calvinism, which began in 1558. If you were a Baptist, you would trace your church back to John Smith, right, a Dutch cleric. Uh, and that began around the turn of the 17th century. And if you were a Methodist, you would trace your church back to John Wesley in 1729. Uh, he was an English cleric. Um, but only if you're Catholic will you historically and accurately be able to trace your church back all the way to Jesus and the apostles and the first century. Okay. But this is, this is Protestantism. Okay, so that was, the, that was the Reformation, a big, big part of church history. Um, and so what did the church... The church suffered from this. Wow, man, uh, we're losing people left and right. What do we do? Okay, well, the Counter-Reformation, the church calls the Counter-Reformation, was the Council of Trent, which started in 1545 and lasted through 1563. It should have started earlier. Right? Uh, and there were reforms that were necessary that had to be done. If the Protestant Reformation had any good results, is it caused this council to happen. And this was one of the most significant councils in church history. That's why it's number eight in our ten peak points, peak moments. So these were all of the doctrines that were redefined by the council. Because now the Christian world was very confused. It was worse than the situation when you had the Pope and the Antipope. It was worse when you had a Pope in Rome and a Pope in France. Who do I listen to? Now I have um, multiple Christian religions and leaders of countries actually, um, like in, in, um, in Denmark and in Switzerland and in Germany, actually going with a particular Protestant religion and the people wanting to do what the king does. Okay. So with all the confusion, the church had to uh, make it absolutely clear what it taught about certain things. All right. So here's what the, the doctrines that it redefined and made clear, right? Uh, the base, basis for truth, truth about faith and morals is found in scripture as well as sacred tradition. And I have, if, if you've been here for all these sessions, uh, I, I've used a lot, well, I've used some references to uh, sacred tradition. Uh, this is what the early church, the very early church, the people that the apostles handed the church onto, what did they do, what did they teach? And I recommended that um, you get the faith of the early fathers, right? Uh, 
because you will find direct quotes in there, quotes that I use all the time. And especially when we get to the sacraments, I'm going to be talking about using that a lot. Uh, because uh, when things are misunderstood or maybe interpreted several different ways uh, in the New Testament, we can go here and say, okay, if you were the next generation, if you were the first pope of Jerusalem after James, uh, you know, and, and, and it was still the first century or just the beginning of the second century, um, and what did he say? You know, he should know. He, he got the, the faith handed right down from the apostle himself. Okay? So um, that, that's the beauty of this sacred tradition. It's been, been there all along. Uh, and all of the books of the Bible were inspired by God. Martin Luther had thrown out seven books of the Old Testament. Okay? We talked about this before. before. Uh, they are what's called the deuterocanonical books or the apocrypha in uh, Protestant Bibles. Uh, uh, we, we explained that before, but they, they were um, some books of the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew scriptures that um, the rabbis decided at one point to remove from their canon, their list of inspired books, because the originals could not be found in Hebrew, just Greek. Okay? Uh, and Martin Luther went back to that. Yeah. Okay. The church up until then uh, used the, uh, uh, the Septuagint, which was a Greek translation uh, of, of the Hebrew. And those seven books were in the Septuagint. The Septuagint was uh, around uh, even at the time of Christ. Okay. The, uh, the sole infallibility, infallible interpreter of Scripture is the Catholic Church. It defined that doctrine. You know, who interprets Scripture? Uh, and the, the church does. Because Jesus had given the church that authority. What you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you bind in uh, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Faith and good works are both needed, not just faith alone for salvation. Each of those seven sacraments was instituted by Christ, not just two. Uh, the Mass is both a sacrament and a sacrifice. It is a sacrifice, not just a holy meal. Uh, this, where the sacrifice of Christ on Calvary is made present for us. And all of church doctrine are contained in the, de in the deposit of faith or divine revelation and are uh, integral parts of the religion founded by Christ. These, these are the, the doctrines that the Council of Trent redefined, made clear what the church taught. Okay. But it went much further than this. It also made the reforms that needed to be made and had caused the, Ref uh, the uh, Reformation to begin with. Right? So the most important thing that the Council of Trent did besides redefining those doctrines, was dealing with the problems that it had. And one of the biggest problems was the, the training of aspirants to the priesthood. Right? So seminaries were set up and strict rules of education and minimum requirements, and, et cetera. Um, since that time until today, in general, priests have master's degrees in theology. Okay? Uh, and so many seminaries were built uh, and organized and, and equipped with a faculty and the obligation of celibacy, which was getting kind of slack in the Middle Ages, that was reinstated. Celibacy for priests, okay? not being married. Um, and so within 100 years of these reforms, the reforms that came from the Council of Trent, uh, the church would change forever, uh, and, uh, and it has. The Council of Trent was one of the biggest things that changed the way it was in the church, things that needed to be changed too. The next historical period that I have to tell you about are the religious wars. This is not a good time. There were wars in different places all over Europe between Catholics and Protestants. Ridiculous. It would be like the wars that go on today between different factions in, in Islam, right? You have Sunnis and Shiites, and they fight together. I mean, why should they? 
They're both Muslims. And why should Catholics and Protestants go to war with each other? They're both Christians, right? Today we would say this was ridiculous because Jesus didn't teach that. He said, love your enemies. Yeah. In, in Ireland, in our lifetime. Right, exactly. Very good example. In our lifetime, in Ireland, there were religious wars between Catholics and Protestants. And now finally, Ireland is actually divided. North Ireland is, is Protestant and the rest of Ireland is Catholic. Uh, and if you're, if you're a known Catholic and you go through some of those Protestant neighborhoods, it is not safe to be there. You know? And that's today in the 21st century. Right, good, very good point. Uh, well, these religious wars were problems because Catholics and Protestants were not acting or living or making decisions as they would if they were living in the imitation of Christ that sacramental life, being a visible sign of God's invisible grace to others, they were anything but this. And tens of thousands of innocent people died in these religious wars in Europe. Uh, actually, religion had little or nothing to do with it. You know, uh, It was mainly political, uh, economic. But anyway, um, this, these wars... Uh, finally ended um, and the future of Protestantism was assured and Europeans were formally divided along religious lines after that. Still the same today. And certain philosophies became common that didn't even exist before. Uh, we talked before about the different things like uh, agnosticism. Uh, we talked about atheism Theism and deism. Deism is, uh, basically says, yes, God exists and God is the creator of the universe out of nothing. Uh, but God doesn't want a personal relationship with his creatures. Now, we say he does. <laughs> That's the reason he's gone through all this trouble for us, right? Uh, but they say he created the world and then he sat back and gave us what we had to work with and does not have personal relationships with anybody. They say religion is not about relationship. We say religion is all about relationship. Okay? So this philosophy was not good for Christianity at all. And it became popular in Europe because of the bad example that Christians gave. There were some very good religious orders, the Jesuits in particular, that started around that time in the 1600s. Uh, and they fought against these philosophies. And they also converted a lot of Protestants back to, to Catholicism. Uh, they were defenders of the Roman Catholic Church. They were educators. And they still are today. We have a, um, a college extension right here, Spring Hill College from Mobile, Alabama. They have an extension in Atlanta. Um, we've had people from St. John Newman who got theology degrees. Um, I don't think they're here anymore, but they were. Um, who got theology degrees at Spring Hill, actually. Um, that's a Jesuit university. There was a period of time in the later Middle Ages called the Enlightenment. And at this time, things started to shift. To shift from what they were where the church was a big part of life, to secularism, where the church wasn't a big part of the daily life of most people. And that's what we have today, secularism, right? The church isn't a big part of the lives of people that you know. Uh, where the church used to be, everything revolved, revolved around the local parish before this, right? So the Enlightenment time, uh, there was more... There was a lot of new scientific discoveries and people started to believe in scientism. In other words, hey, science has the answer for any, everything. We don't need the church anymore. Okay? Well, they have the answer to some things, but they don't have the answer to everything. There's some things that science will never know. Okay? Um, utilitarianism. I have a slide for that. No. Um, utilitarianism became the most common philosophy that people ascribe to. 
Uh, if you ask college students, most or many college students have to study the humanities and social sciences, and they'll, they'll study these different philosophies and their founders. And when you describe different philosophies uh, to students, they will always pick utilitarianism as their favorite philosophy because it's the, it's the greatest happiness principle, it was called, right? Hey, do whatever makes you happy. As long as it doesn't hurt somebody, do whatever makes you happy or will make the, most, the, the, the largest amount of people happy. That's utilitarianism, basically. Uh, and that became popular. John Stuart Mill is known for, the, for that. Uh, these are problems that affected the church. Liberalism right, affected the church, too. Uh, Anti-clericalism, right? People against clerics, uh, church um, priests and, and bishops and abbots uh, you know, because of their past uh, and uh, just general, a general feeling in Europe. So these were threats of the church. Liberalism was a threat. And this all built up uh, to Vatican I. Vatican I was in Rome. Um, there's a Vatican I and a Vatican II. The one we know the best is Vatican II. We're going to do that in a minute um, because we'll, we'll end there at Vatican II, I guess. Uh, but this opened on the, 9th, on the 8th of December. That's the Feast of the Immaculate Conception uh, in 1869 and adjourned uh, in October 1870. Um, it was 300 years since the Council of Trent. And after many years of setbacks, the church began to make considerable strides now um, as it approached um, the 20th century. And um, a lot of progress was made in countries that were formerly Protestant, like France, England, Ireland, Germany. Uh, and things started to the pendulum went in the other direction. And the most important uh, figure in the church at the time was Pius IX, and he summoned this council. Uh, and it defined once and for all papal primacy, in other words, hey, the pope's the boss, and papal infallibility. And well, when we get to that, uh, we, we're going to spend a session talking about church authority and where it comes from and, and how it's um, how it was instituted by Christ. But uh, that doesn't mean that the Pope needs, knows everything. It's not that he can forecast the weather or make predictions of what's going to happen in the future. It's just that when he teaches it, and declares that he's teaching uh, from the chair of Peter, then uh, the Holy Spirit keeps him from teaching error. Okay, Very seldom used. It's only been used twice. Okay. Uh, but Vatican I redefined that, you know, because the church needed to, to make it clear what it had taught all along about the authority that the church had. And we'll spend a, a, a session on that. Modernism was another thing, much like scientism, especially with the new findings of science and with Charles Dal uh, Darwin and, uh, and his theory of evolution. Uh, it started even uh, textbooks saying it wasn't necessary for God to uh, create the world because people evolved from lesser life forms. Well, the point is, though, God may have used things like evolution as part of his creation process over time. Um, and, and, uh, and one doesn't have to believe that the world was created in seven literal days um, as, as you would read in the book of Genesis. Okay. okay, the last thing and a very significant thing that we have to talk about, it'll take us until the end of our time, is Vatican II in the 1960s. I was in elementary school at the time and just starting high school in the seminary. I was in a high school seminary for most all of high school. Uh, it was started by John the, the 23rd, who was just canonized a pope recently, a saint recently, and uh, he died in the middle of the council, 
and so it was taken up again by Paul the sixth okay they're pretty well known they're they're popes of our lifetimes well not all of our lifetimes but my lifetime anyway uh, but the second Vatican Council was the most significant events in the church in the 20th in, a, in our lifetimes the most significant event there were major changes in liturgy okay the mass was said in the vernacular instead of Latin. Before that, it was said in Latin. I was an altar boy uh, in elementary school, Catholic elementary school, St. John the Evangelist, uh, and I was a, naturally an altar boy when I was in the seminary, and we had mass every day, and we said the Latin responses, you know, ecum spiritu tuo, you know, we sung them and we said them, yeah. Uh, and some people remember them, right? And, uh, but that changed. It is something that Martin Luther had wanted, but the church wouldn't do back in the Council of Trent. It took them until the, Council, the Second Vatican Council to do it. Yeah. So there are some things that maybe should have happened sooner. Huh? <laughs> okay, well, they also gave a more active role of the laity. Before that, you never had Eucharistic ministers that weren't ordained, right? You never had lectors that weren't ordained. Now you do. Uh, you have lay people, men and women, uh, having roles in the public prayer of the church, especially at Mass. The permanent diaconate was, in, was reinst reinstated, right? Uh, there were deacons in the church, permanent deacons. In other words, we didn't, that didn't become eventually priests. There were permanent deacons in the church right from the beginning. We hear about deacons before we hear about presbyters, priests. Uh, we, hear about, we had bishops and deacons before we had priests. And eventually, the, the bishops had to ordain priests because they couldn't do everything themselves. Uh, and uh, anyway, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to holy orders even more. But that was reinstated at Vatican II, that there would be permanent deacons because that fell out somewhere, somewhere along maybe around 800 or or. 900, the year 800 or 900, that kind of fell out. And there were deacons still, but there were only transitional deacons. They would, they would be deacons for a year and then become priests, right? Uh, but the permanent diaconate, people like me that stay deacons for life, was reinst uh, reinstated. Uh, and it was a greater emphasis on the Bible, right? People were encouraged to read the Bible and have Bible studies. And every parish, I hope every parish, has numerous Bible studies as we do here, available to people as we do here at St. John Newman. Uh, there was greater attention to uh, social problems. There was greater attention to the social, social teachings of the church, right? And a new climate of ecumenism. In other words, dialogue with the Protestants and the Orthodox instead of, you know, you know, He's not allowed in one of their churches or anything like that, okay? A new climate. So Vatican II was about redefining church, what the church is meant to be in the modern world. Not changing its teaching and doctrine, not changing it, uh, but changing its practice for sure, redefining what it's supposed to be. Uh, the church has always reflected on a divine revelation that it has, had been handed on to it and in interpreting it and, and applying it, all right? Uh, established lay ministries, a uh, sense of ecumenism, that uh, still goes on today. There is a possibility that in our lifetimes, Catholic and Orthodox might be joined, you know? Uh, that is possible. Uh, Pope Benedict wanted that. Pope Francis wants that. Uh, hopefully, uh, it does happen. Uh, there... Uh, there was a new emphasis on evangelization, a social justice, and of course the, the permanent diaconate. Yeah. Um, I'd like the younger people to know that that's when the altar turned around. Oh yeah, that's that's right. That's right. Yeah, good point. I'm glad you're here because uh, you remember you know, you remember Warren remembers these things too. Right. Uh, where the, the like I said when I went to that uh, church in Assisi. The altar was facing away from the people so that the people faced the same way as the priest did, right? Uh, but 
the idea of Vatican II was to have better participation by everybody in the Mass. That's why it was done in the language of the congregation called the vernacular, and why uh, it, the altar was turned around. So, and, and altar railings were taken down that used to separate the congregation from the sanctuary. You know, more open, uh, and, and, and therefore uh, people could actually see exactly what's going on every little thing, and participate fully and understand. Yeah, good, very good point. These are some recommendations. We're, we're, we're basically done. But these are some recommendations of some history books. If you find the history of the church interesting and you want to go further, uh, here are um, three textbooks that I would recommend. The last one is the best one, A Popular History of the Catholic Church, Carl Koch. Okay, uh, to me, that's the easiest of these. Um, the next one would be St. Joseph's Church History. Okay. The Concise History of the Catholic Church, that's the one, the textbook that's used in many programs, and that's not uh, as concise as you would think. <laughs> uh, but you'd have to say, I would have to say, that the church, the Catholic Church, is as strong as the divine power that is in it. You know, And with over 1.2 billion members worldwide today, the church is today what it was called to be from the beginning, and that is the sacrament of salvation for the whole world until the end of time. Um, it has had its ups and downs and rough times. There has been the good, the bad, and the ugly. But through it all, we can see the Holy Spirit guiding the church through the rough times. Even though the church has human beings in it, because of human beings, things will go wrong. Remember, even the apostles themselves, right? One betrayed Jesus. Another one denied him three times. And he ended up being the first pope, St. Peter himself, okay? Who Jesus chose as the leader of the church. Um, he forgave him. Uh, but because there's human beings, there will be struggles. There will be good times and bad times. Good decisions and bad decisions. But through all of it, the Holy Spirit works through the church preserves its truth and doctrine, um, and always sends something to redeem it, like uh, the saints that we've had through the ages. Right? Okay, next week...